Calvary. He shed his blood. He took my sins. He took my iniquity. He took my stupidity. He took everything upon him, hung it on a cross, said, boy, get up to the river, and don't you dare stop. You keep right on going. That's the only way that I'll make it, but thank God I'm going. Amen. That's right. Sing another song. Let's praise and worship God. Brother Dennis, get your mind on God. You're going to have something to say tonight. right now, Lord. Come on, just lift your hands across this place. Just praise Him right now, church. Yes, thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. Let's sing this one little chorus right here like this. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. Feel the brush of angels' wings 
I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Oh, we're going to sing it one more time. Just lift your hand to sing it. Oh, surely the presence. of angels wings I see glory on each face surely the presence of the Lord is in this place yes amen come on church give him some praise tonight amen he's worthy yes Lord Praise the Lord, church. You know, I was traveling this week. And I was going throughout yesterday. I was riding up to North Carolina. And I was talking on the TV. I don't like to do that a lot because there's a lot of garbage out there. But I was talking on the CB. And I told this man I'd been talking to probably about for the last 100 miles. I told him, I said, well... I said, you're going up this road and I'm going up this one. I said, I'll be going over to North Carolina, you'll be going to Virginia. I said, so this right here at this split where we part ways. I said, they call me the Georgia preacher man. I said, we'll catch you on the flip side. There was a man, we'd been talking for a long time and there was a man that spoke up and he said something that really vexed my spirit. And it shouldn't have, but it did. He said, well, I hope you practice what you preach. And I told him, I said, come again. He said, I hope you practice what you preach. I hope you're not one of these Christians that run out here with the cross in lights on the back of your tractor trailer and your crosses with your little vinyl lettering on the side of your truck and then you come flying by me speeding. And I was like, okay, so what you're saying is you're upset with me because I'm a Christian, but yet my truck's not neutered. My truck can go faster than the speed limit. So you're mad at me because my boss lets my truck go as fast as it wants to. Oh, well, I ain't even gonna talk to you. I ain't gonna argue with you. I just ask a simple question. I'm not gonna argue with you because you got an attitude. And I can see right now that's not a Christian attitude. I'm not gonna argue with you. And I politely asked him, then why did you ask that question? Why did you interject into a conversation that you were not a part of for the last 100 miles? And I started talking to him. And he kept calling and saying that I got an attitude. You got an attitude. And it ain't a Christian attitude. You getting all upset. And he started using profanity and stuff talking to me. And I said, you know what? I said, my Bible tells me every day what I need to do. I said, I don't have to listen to somebody else tell me what the Bible means. I said, I don't have to listen to a preacher across a pulpit. No disrespect, Brother Greg. He's my pastor. This is my senior pastor, Brother Bob. I love these men to death. I cherish them, but I don't have to listen to what they say across this pulpit because my Bible tells me to let every man be a lie and let my word be the truth. 
2 Timothy 2.15 also says, to study, to show thyself approved unto who? Unto God. Not unto man, unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Not somebody else's interpretation, but what the Bible says. Everybody says, well, you need to read Dr. Reverend so-and-so's book, or you need to read Dr. Reverend so-and-so's book over here, or Sister Dr. Reverend so-and-so. Why? Why do I need to read their book? If they're right, did they not get it out of the same book I got in front of me? Do I not have the same book? It, was, it written, was it not written by the same author? If this is where they got it, am I not reading the right book I need to read? Does it not say that let the Holy Ghost be your teacher? So I've got the same author, the same book, and the same teacher as they had. So why I got to read their book? Why don't I read his book? His book tells me what I need to know. And then another one jumped in there and says, well, this man finally, giving him enough scripture, it shut that devil up. He wouldn't even talk to me no more. Then another man kicked in. He said, well, you know, I don't know why he thinks he's got the, the only, that he knows everything because there's so many interpretations. And I said, and I'll tell you something, devil. The Bible says it's not open to private interpretation. I said, so all these different interpretations ain't nothing but somebody not wanting the whole 100% truth of God's word and they go out and start their own religion. Then they go over here and they write their own Bible and they take away from the real original word of God and they write in there for it to mean what they want it to mean. Oh, well, let's just go out here and write the New Living Testament or the New International Version. Let's just get all these different interpretations. And then what do you got? You got another man's opinion, another educated theologian's opinion of what that verse means. I'd rather have the original. The 1611 King James Version was the last interpretation, if you want to say it, but it was the last revelation of the, the old scrolls before they were lost. I'd rather have that. Because if I can't figure that out, then I, I go back to thinking what Jesus told Peter. Peter said, Lord, why do you speak to these people in parables? They, can't, they won't understand. And Jesus said, it ain't that they won't understand. It's that they can't understand because it's not for them. But to you, I shall reveal the mystery." To you, to my people, the ones that get into this word and let the Holy Ghost inside of them interpret this Bible. And I said, you're sitting here telling me that, that, that there's so many interpretations. I said, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. I said, that's, that's God. John 1.14, and then the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. I said, that's Jesus. That's the word. I said, and then the Holy Ghost is the spirit of Jesus. When he left, he said, I must leave for if I leave not, the comforter cannot come. That's the Holy Ghost. It's coming inside of us. It came on the day of Pentecost. That's the word. They're all three the word. So if I told him, I said, if you got a dollar yesterday, you got a dollar today, you got a dollar tomorrow, it's still a dollar. It don't turn into a hundred dollar bill. I said, God is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. It, he does not change. That shut that devil up. For the next two minutes, I dared either one of them to say anything. I kept making comments. I said, well, you know what? I said, I love it when the word of God, the true word of God shuts a bunch of devils up and I drove on. I drove on because that's where God wanted me. He wanted me, and he says, that's not what you shall say in that day, for I shall give you utterance. I didn't think not one time about what I was supposed to say. As soon as they said something, the Holy Ghost brought it to my remembrance, and I spit it out across the sea beam. 
I told the first guy, I said, you're talking to me, you're saying that you don't want to talk to me because I'm ignorant and I'm stupid and I have an attitude that you don't like. I said, well, let me explain something to you. I said, you've showed your ignorance three times. Number one, you quoted something that wasn't in the Bible. I said, I know because I've researched it because I was in a church for 30 years that taught it and it was a lie because I researched it and I found it wasn't in there. I said, number two, you told me you didn't want to argue with me, but yet you sat here and you're trying to argue with me. You started the conversation with an argumentative question. And number three, you're cursing. You're getting all mad and you're cursing at me and I'm not mad. I said, this is my attitude. I am passionate about the love of Jesus Christ and what he's done for me. Very passionate. And people think that I'm getting angry, but I'm not getting angry. I'm getting passionate. I'm getting anointed. I'm ready to give you what God has given me. And I said, so three times you proved your ignorance. Shall we go for four? And the man, he just, he just hushed. The Bible tells me that evil cannot stay in the presence of righteousness. When you quote this Bible and you quote it in the right spirit, not a condemning, not a condemning spirit, not coming out with condemnation on somebody else, quoting it to try to show them their sin. I think it was Paul that said that if it were not for the law, I would never have known sin. So what God has taught me just in the last few weeks, he's taught me that we come out here with this Bible and we talk to people and we give it to them. And a lot of times they think we've got the broom out beating them over the head with it because we just don't understand. We're like, well, what, why can't they get this? Why can't why can't you understand this? Why can't you go by these rules? And it's not for them. They can't go by it because just like he said about the cherubims walking around the throne with the Lamb of God on it, with the slain Lamb. That's what they were designed for. You can't take a wheel and use it for a back door on your vehicle. It won't work. It was not designed that way. They were not designed to get this word. You cannot, you, if you sit there for 30 hours and you were anointed from God, they still wouldn't get it because God is the one that made them that way. That's what makes me laugh at these people when they say, well, I'm homosexual because God made me that way. You're exactly right. You are sure right. You are exactly like that because God made you that way. They come up and they claim to be, oh, well, we're the seed of Abraham. Did they not? That's what they claimed, ain't it, Brother Greg? We are the seed of Abraham. Jesus said, no, you are of your father the devil, and his work shall ye do. It says that the devil is a liar and the father of it. The father of it. So if you go out there and tell a little white lie, guess what? What are you doing? You're, protect, you're, you're putting yourself up under that curse. That's right. That's what Revelation says. He that maketh or believeth a lie is damned already. Meaning as soon as you make it, you're damned already. As soon as you conceive it in your mind, and you put it into action. That's the end of it. And people say, well, what's the difference? Why, why can't we give these people, why can't we give them what we got? Why can't we give them? Why? Because we don't have compassion. And when they see us dealing with a the devil, they don't see compassion. They see us trying to beat them upside the head with the broomstick. They don't see the compassion, the love of Christ. He didn't beat them upside the head with a broomstick. He did, however, take a whip and drive them out of the house of God and said, you shall not make 
my father's house, a den of thieves. He drove them out. Now, wait a minute. Hold on a minute, brother. That's anger. Yes, that is anger. The Bible even says, be ye angry, yet sin not. Be ye angry. And see, what the world and what you don't seem to understand and what I didn't seem to understand until God revealed it to me is, I can be angry. I can even be angry at the world. But why be angry at somebody that can't understand the word of God because God made them that way? That's being angry at God because he made somebody that way and I can't understand with my little minute mind why they're that way. The Bible says, cast not your pearl before the swine lest they trample it under their feet and turn again and rend you. A lot of people don't understand that verse. They're like, well, what is he saying there? He's saying there's some people you don't need to give this word to. And how are we supposed to know that, Brother Dennis? I'll tell you how you're supposed to know that. By the Spirit. That's exactly right, Brother Greg. By the Spirit. When you're talking to somebody, you know if they're haughty and high-minded. You know if they're a religious devil. They got one definition of their religion. I believe it because my pastor said it. Well, that can't be right, Brother Dennis, because my pastor said this, 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 and this. My pastor said, we're getting out of here before the rapture. We're coming up, and there's two in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. You're right. But the parable of the sower said that in the morning, the sower comes and sows the seed. And when the evening comes, the evil one comes and sows the tares. And the next morning, when the sower returns, the tares are growing with the wheat. So now you got the tares growing with the wheat. And he said, but the farmer, the sower does not uproot the tares lest he also uproot the wheat. He lets them grow together. And when the harvest comes, he harvests up tares first, bundles them up, throws them in the fire to be consumed. So I tell him, you want to take that first glory train, you go right ahead. I said, because I'm going to stick around. I, I want to be left behind in your rapture. I want to be left behind in your rapture because your rapture is the first one. And according to the parable, the tares are the first one that's going to be taken out. So I'd rather be left behind because then I'm going to be tried with fire. But in order to make it there, I have to have compassion. I have to understand that Brother Greg over here, he ain't going to sin like me because he's Brother Greg. I'm Brother Dennis. He don't drive a truck. I do. I have to deal with morons. He has to deal with morons in another situation. We deal with our different morons in different ways. And then, and then they deal with us. But then we have anger toward them. We have anger. Oh, you have an attitude. That's not Christian-like. I asked the guy on the radio, I said, what do you think? Jesus was a doormat? I said, so we're supposed to be doormat? Aren't we supposed to be like Jesus? I said, didn't he call one of them? A, he called one of them a generation of vipers? A bunch of snakes? I said, he drove some of them out of the temple that were swapping and trading inside the temple. He drove them out. <laughs> I mean... Was he as calm and cool and loving as you thought? Was he? When they come to stone the woman because she, she had, they had caught her in an adulterous affair. He said, okay, fine. He that is without sin cast the first stone. They looked around. They all disappeared. He said, ma'am, you can get up because I don't see your accusers. He said, where are your accusers? They weren't there. They weren't there. And see, that's what we don't understand. Just because somebody else sins differently than us doesn't mean they're not a child of God. Just because they're caught up with that devil. Eve fell into the trap of the devil. The very first one to fall into the trap. But was 
Was it okay just to sweep her out with the rest of the trash? Just take and sweep her out with the rest of the, let's just put it this way. Are you just going to sweep all the people out together? That old saying comes to mind. I was talking to my mom earlier tonight. That old saying comes to mind. One man's trash is another man's treasure. See, and if you sweep all the trash out at once and throw it away, you don't know what you're going to find. But you don't know what you're going to lose either, Brother Greg. You don't know if you're sitting there looking at 15 crack whores. You don't know that one of them might be a child of God that has been deceived by the devil, that he's gotten a hold of his mind and he's turned them into whatever they are, whatever they've become. The woman came to the well, said, you've been married five times and the one you're with now is not your husband. Now what would we have done? Oh, look at that whore over there. Boy, I tell you what, I hope she don't come to my church. But what did God say? What did Jesus, sitting right there on the well, say? Say it again. I must needs go by Samaria. And if you drink of what I have, you'll never thirst again. He went to that well for a purpose. He went there for a purpose because he went there to have compassion on a woman that nobody else was going to have compassion on. His love. His love doesn't mean you're going to sit here like a doormat. You're going to let people wipe their feet on you and walk on over you. His love means that when you see somebody you give them God's love. And through the discernment of the Spirit, and only through the discernment of the Spirit, not the discernment of your mind or your righteousness, but the discernment of the Spirit, God will let you know how much to give them. I've been doing this on the road for about the last six months, going to these truck stops, talking to these people. God lets me know when they're a religious devil. Ain't nothing but the Baptists going to heaven. Ain't nothing but the Presbyterians going to heaven. Ain't nothing but the Catholic going to heaven. And when I get that feeling, I don't reveal everything God's revealed to me. I just say, you know what, brother? They'll quote something. I'll say, you know what, brother? You're exactly right. That's in the Bible. And it is. But it's just like I told that man. He said, well, I go by, I go by one verse, Proverbs 3 and 5. You know what that says? I said, no, sir. I said, I just started studying just a little while back to be a minister. I said, so I haven't memorized the dead letter yet. I said, but I'm sure you're going to enlighten me. He says, it says to trust not, to lean not on your own understanding, but to trust in the Lord. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I know that verse. I've heard my pastor quote that verse. I know that verse. I just didn't know where to find it. And I said, but it also says, let the Holy Ghost be your teacher. It also says, 2 Timothy 2.15, to study to show thyself approved unto God. I said, it says that too. And I said, so while you're not leaning on your own understanding, I said, whose understanding are you leaning on? I said, are you leaving Dr. Reverend so-and-so across the pulpit at your church? Or on the radio? I said, is who you're trusting in? Do you read your Bible? Do you know what John 3, 17 says? Because a lot of people know what John 3, 16 says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. We all know that. But what does, exactly, what does 17 say? It says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, that that the world through him might be saved. Now, how are they going to be saved if we don't have that same compassion? He didn't send us out here to judge all these people. He didn't send us out here to walk up and down these streets and look at somebody and immediately we know that they're unsavable. He did not send us for that reason. He didn't send his only son that died on the cross, 
bled, suffered, died, was beaten, betrayed by his best friends, denied by one of his best friends three different times. And the man, as we say in the old church, lost his religion and cursed. But he was right beside Jesus. Oh, Lord, I'll never leave you. And Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, you'll deny me three times. You'll deny me thrice before the cock crows. And you know what? Just like the rest of the word of God, it came true. Everybody says, well, the Bible contradicts itself. I said, no, your intelligence contradicts the Bible. I said, your intelligence contradicts the Bible. I said, because the Bible is the same from the front to the back as it is from the back to the front. You can read it backwards. And I said, and it's not like back in the old days when they wanted to play the rock and roll music backwards to hear some devil worshiping message. I said, this don't turn into a devil when you turn it around backwards. I said, it turns into a revelation. And when you get to revelation, you don't need nobody else's interpretation. But compassion is what we need because we don't have it anymore. No church has it anymore. You go to a Baptist church and you see people standing around at a Baptist church and you see some of them standing over here then you see another bunch standing over here that this still has what we call that besetting sin. They're standing over there smoking a cigarette and you got 15 other people over here talking about them. Well, look at him over there. Well, yeah, he done switched from Marlboro's to Cools. He done went menthol, you know? And then they're going to go home and cut on the TV. And when they cut the TV on, they got to send the kids to the other room because what they're watching ain't worth the kids' ears. They don't want the kids to spit it out in church and embarrass them. My rule of the house, and my wife has to remind me sometimes if the kids can't watch it, you shouldn't watch it either. Yes, ma'am, you're right. You're right. I was sitting there the other day. We put a movie in. It was a movie I've had for a long time. I didn't even realize it. I put it in, started playing it. All of a sudden, some language started flying out of it. I was like, whoa, stop, stop, stop. It, I know, the batteries always go dead right when you're mashing it to stop it. Because there was words in it back when I was in the world, I didn't realize it was that bad. Because I looked over it. I was part of it. So I was part of it, so therefore I didn't know it. But now I'm not a part of it, and it shows. And it comes out, and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. I can't watch this. This ain't godly. But now, what would happen if somebody come in the house saw that movie sitting on the shelf and they knew that movie because they watched it when they were in the world too. Oh, Lord. Here we go. Brother Dennis is going to burn in hell and his fire is going to be a little bit hotter than everybody else's. Y'all see that movie on his shelf? Lord, let me tell you what movie he had on his shelf. You know, even I took it out. We don't watch it. We don't play it. It's sitting there. Exactly. So now that I know that movie's like that, it'll be gone out of my house to the pawn shop. I'll let some other devil buy it. <laughs> What'd you say? Burn it, Brother Greg. <laughs> but my thought is this. I don't know where God wants to take me. I understand now why I couldn't get on that plane this morning. I was supposed to fly out this morning at 740. I was supposed to fly out to Phoenix, Arizona. And then they were going to put me on a little puddle jumper, take me over to Tucson, Arizona to pick up a truck because one of the drivers had uh, gotten arrested for something simple, but he was from out of state, so they're holding him. Well, they was going to get me to get the truck, take it to California, deliver the load, and then get me a load back home. And see, God had something else in mind. 
He knew what Brother Greg was going to do today. He knew that Brother Greg was going to obey the Spirit and he was going to put me behind this pulpit. He knew because he'd been telling me about this message about compassion for a long time. And I said, I told my mother today, I said, I got it and he's going to let me preach it whenever he lets me preach it. But he's, he's preparing me for it. Just like the woman was sitting in her house, her and her son. She had just enough meal in the barrel to prepare a cake and eat it and die. And those are the exact words she said to the prophet. But how many of you know that God had a different plan? How many of you know that the prophet of God listened to that plan? And when he came by that house, he stepped in the house. The woman invited him in. And he said, do you have anything to eat? She says, I have enough meal to bake a cake for me and my son and for us to eat it and die. And he said, be good. But first, fix me a cake. Fix me one. But sir, I only have enough. No, fix me one. If she wouldn't have obeyed the will of God, she would have died. But she listened to the will of God. And when she listened to the will of God, Jesus himself had compassion on her and her barrel was never empty. Never empty. Now you can take that and you can take it for what it says that she was fed for the rest of her life and then you can look at it spiritually that she was fed for the rest of her life. So she was fed physically for the rest of her life and she was fed spiritually for the rest of her life by one act of compassion. She had compassion on the prophet that he had been traveling and he was weary and he needed food and that Jesus had compassion on her and her son for the rest of their life. Not tomorrow, not next week, the rest of her life. How many of us can trust God like that? How many of us have compassion on somebody that we see? And I'm not talking about every single person you see hitchhiking down the road. I'm talking about when you see something and God puts it on your heart and you know that's God putting it on your heart. And you keep going. Or you turn the other way so you don't see it. You're turning your back on your blessing. You're turning your back on your very, the very blessing God is wanting to bless you with. You're turning your back on it and walking away because you failed to have compassion. How many people do we know today? Just, just the people that we know are having a tough time and are getting shown no compassion that we know. I mean, we know them personally. They're family members, friends, friend, family members of friends, and they see no hope. And they're like, well, you know, why do I want to be a Christian? Church ain't helping me none. You know, my sister goes to church every, every day. Every day, every day the doors are open, she's in church. They have a special meeting, she's in church. They have a cookout, she's in church. But ain't none of them come by here and ask me why my lights are off. Ain't none of them come by here and ask me why I can't afford the food because I don't have enough children. I don't have enough children to qualify for any assistance and then what assistance I do qualify ain't going to do nothing for me. I don't have electricity to keep the refrigerator running. So the food's going to spoil. You know, how many of them, even her own sister, how many of them has told me, come on in the house. We got a back room back there. We'll move the kids all in one room. You can have that one. Because it's going to come down to that, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to get rough. 
And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not, as, as I like to say about some of the old time preachers, they're doomsday preachers. I'm not a doomsday preacher. But I know it's fixing to get rough. I know it's fixing to get really rough. And, and a lot of people are trying to prepare for it. And, you know, I always go back. God always takes me back to the children in the wilderness. How did they prepare for it? It was 40 years. They thought they was going to take a short journey to a new land that flowed with milk and honey. Is that not what Moses told them? Milk and honey. Oh, man, we got it made. And then they were in the wilderness for 40 years years some of us can't go six hours in a day without eating something and they were in the wilderness for 40 years yeah now I'm getting on you brother Greg (laughs) we can't go six hours but we got people in our own country that our own country ain't taking care of that are going days some of them weeks without food and this is not to give me any glory because my wife knows this is to give God the glory there's a group that I only know because I knew some of the people that were in it they were friends of my uncles I grew up with them there's a group in Athens Athens, Georgia there's a, there's a bridge on North Avenue It's what they call it. There's a big train trussle goes across the top of it. And there's a group of people up under it called the bridge people. And the the city knows they're there. Everybody knows they're there. And you know what? Nobody goes to see them. Nobody goes to talk to them. Nobody goes to take them food. Nobody goes to take them blankets and clothes. These people, when I got there, these people were wearing clothes, looked like they'd been laying in the fire to keep warm. And we're talking polyester pinstripe suits that they had gotten from the Salvation Army burnt almost the polyester that'll stick to your skin when it burns. And they've been laying in the fire to stay warm. Soot all over them. Hugging my neck, thanking me because I brought them some, some of those big gallon pickle jars. And I brought them rice and beans, something they can store in them pickle jars and heat them up a little at a time that'll last something that expands when it cooks, and it'll be good for all of them. Everybody's like, okay, well, that's fine. So what else? Well, I bought them pots and pans. How are they going to cook it without pots and pans? It's all nice that the homeless shelter and these other places during the holidays take their excess food in these little, uh, little aluminum pans down there and feeds them for a day. But then I went down there and I started ministering to them. Because my Bible tells me I'm supposed to give them everything. Not just food for the flesh. Food for the soul. There's an old proverb that says, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you'll feed him for life. Well, wasn't wasn't, uh, Peter a fisherman? Didn't God bless? Didn't Jesus stand on that shore and bless the fish? So that's what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen. I know I didn't quote any scriptures tonight. I didn't read anything out of the Bible tonight. But you know, if you got any questions, I can show you. Because God has given me. Every time somebody asks me something, God gives it to me. And I find it in my Bible. And nowhere in my Bible did I see God turn his back on anybody. He gave everybody a chance. He even gave Lucifer himself a chance. And what did he do? He got jealous. And if you want to go a little bit further, he got jealous of us. We were supposed to be servants unto him and his angels, not the other way around. And he got jealous. And he did what I tell my children not to do. He made a permanent decision on a temporary emotion. And that's what we do. We see somebody. We get a feeling. 
or goosebumps or we get a bad feeling or we get something. We don't know what it is because we ain't connected with the Spirit of God enough. We hadn't prayed enough. We hadn't fasted enough. We hadn't got out on our knees. We hadn't been in the Word enough to know what it is. We just don't like it. That may be the Spirit of God in them trying to call out to us because he knows that that flesh is in trouble and it needs help. But we don't know. So therefore, we don't know the compassionate spirit. We just think, oh, well, I'm gonna stay away from that. And we make a permanent decision by walking away from a blessing that God has for us on a temporary emotion every day. So what you have to ask yourself is this. Are we going to do enough to stay in God's will and in his spirit and in his word and on our knees enough to where we understand that we have to make decisions according to the word of God? That we're losing our blessings when we make a permanent decision on a temporary emotion. That goes for anger and everything. So I ask that we just pray that we don't make the permanent decision on a temporary emotion because we're losing our blessings. God bless you. Let's give the Lord another great big hand clap. Hey Amen. Won't you go ahead and stand to your feet? I want to tell you something. He was talking about old brother Peter right there. Brother Peter had got to the point that he denied God. And he went down there, and that woman looked over there and said, Hey, boy, ain't you one of them? He said, No, I ain't him. He looked at him again. She looked at him again and said, Hey, hey, no, no, I, I believe you might be one of them men hanging around Jesus. And he looked at her and he said, No, 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 no. You got me mistaken. I'm not one of him. And he looked over there again. She said, No, I know that you are one of them. So he done what? He thought he'd get a little mad and get that little preacher's religion that he had and cuss a little bit. But I want to tell you something. Even when a man of God is a man of God, he can't even cuss right. She looked at him and said, you can't even cuss right. Give me something over there, bro. I want to know that's what we're talking about tonight. If you are the elect seed of God, if you are his, you cannot do the wrong for God to straighten you out every single time. You give him praise, you give him honor. This week you find yourself somewhere when you began to wake up in the cool of the day, began to call upon him, began to talk to him, began to give him thanks and praise and glory and began to see how God will move his thing out of your way and began to bless you, began to get you excited, began to, to get your children excited. Amen. It's worth a shout in the house of the Lord. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Let's have some of this good stuff. I'm ready. Come on, just, just, just give him a hand clap of praise, church. Yeah. Tell you something. God showed up tonight, amen.